In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. or something out of balance. Our lives can sometimes be out of focus and out of balance. So today we're going to be talking about our life coming into focus as we fix our attention and focus upon Jesus. Open to the book of Colossians and follow along with us. Does it amaze anybody else that it's already November? Doesn't it seem like the year just goes by faster and faster and faster? And every year seems to pick up more speed and go faster and faster and it's a little unsettling because as things start to pick up speed and go faster and faster, it's unsettling because you figure it can't go on like that forever. There's going to come a time where it's going to stop. And so it's a little unsettling. You know, my dad, he, he was an iron worker for 45 plus years. And back in 1971, he fell eight stories, which is more than 100 feet. It's a miracle that he lived through that, totally unhurt. Absolutely a miracle. And every time he's told me that story, he always tells me, you know, the fall's not that bad. It's the sudden stop that'll kill you. So that, yeah, yeah, it's the sudden stop. So things just go faster and faster. So today's November 1st. Halloween is behind us. 54 days till Christmas. I know, everybody says, don't tell me that, guys. Take note. 54 days, don't wait, 53 days, 54 days till Christmas. It is officially the holiday season, uh, but before Christmas comes, uh, one of my favorite holidays of the year, the holiday that November is known for, Thanksgiving. How many of you guys like Thanksgiving? I love Thanksgiving. Such a great holiday. And Thanksgiving, it is an important reminder, an important reminder for us to be thankful. You know, the awesome thing about Thanksgiving, it is rooted in religious tradition. We're not the only nation that celebrates a day of national Thanksgiving. Thankfully, there are other nations that do that as well. But it is a holiday rooted in religious tradition, especially the Christian tradition, and it acknowledges that there is one to which we are to be thankful. It acknowledges that all the things that we have, and don't we have a lot of awesome things that God has blessed us with, but it acknowledges that life and family, and friends, and a place to live, and food to eat, that all these things came from someone who's given them to us. So it's an opportunity to be thankful to God for his divine providence in our lives. And it's such an important thing that we need to do. Thanksgiving, not just the holiday, but as an attitude and as an act, they are essential, essential ingredients to living a fulfilling life. I shared a, a sermon series a few years ago back in 2011 called The Key to Unlocking Joy, and one of the messages that I gave talked about gratitude being one of the keys for us to unlock a life of joy. When you find someone whose life is animated by joy, you find someone whose life is characterized by gratitude. You cannot have joy, continual joy in your life, without being a person who gives thanks. And so it's such an important thing for us to be those who are thankful people. A couple of weeks ago, we started a new series here at Cross Connection called Christocentric. We're studying through the book of Colossians in the New Testament. If you have your Bible, you can open to Colossians. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand and one of our ushers will bring you one. Colossians is very near the end of your Bible, right after the book of Philippians and just before the books of First and Second Thessalonians, right near the end. A little small book called Colossians, was written nearly 2,000 years ago by an early Christian apostle, a guy by the name of Paul, Paul the Apostle. And when Paul wrote this letter, 
started his letter, although we call it the book of Colossians, when he wrote this letter to a group of Christians living in the city of Colossae, he was in a difficult situation, found himself in some pressing circumstances. He was in the city of Rome, not for a sightseeing tour. He was in the city of Rome as a prisoner of the empire of Rome, awaiting the day of his trial before the highest court of the land, before Caesar Nero. A trial that had a very uncertain future before the Apostle Paul. He didn't know what was going to come for him. Although he hoped that he would be released, that he would be able to continue to do the work of preaching the gospel in places where the gospel had not been preached before, he still didn't know what was going to happen. Ultimately, he would, through that trial and through that going before Caesar Nero, suffer a martyr's death. He would be put to death for his faith in Christ. But here he is there waiting for the time of that trial under house arrest in the city of Rome. And as I've shared with you before, he he wrote four different letters during this time. We've studied these letters this year, the letters to the church at Ephesus, the book of Ephesians, the book of Philippians, the book of Philemon, and now we're studying through the book of Colossians. And the awesome thing is, is that that book to the church in Philippi, the letter to the Philippian Christians, has been called by many Christian teachers the New Testament letter of joy. And in it, Paul talks about his overflowing joy. He talks about having no lack, and yet the circumstance that he was in in that moment, with an uncertain future there under house arrest, awaiting a trial, it seems like not a place where you would be experiencing joy, especially an overflow of joy. It doesn't seem like you would be using words like, I have no lack, I am full. I mean, there are many people in our own nation where we have so much who couldn't say those words. I have no lack, and I am full. And so you wonder, what was it in the Apostle Paul's life that could cause him or enable him to have joy and to say, I have no lack, I am full, and yet be in dire circumstances, difficult trials? Well, one of the answers to that question, I believe, is is found in the passage that we're looking at. So Colossians chapter 1, would you stand with me? Colossians 1 verse 3 is where we're going to be today. If you hope you'd pardon my voice, my dear little Evangeline, she's learning how to share. She shared her cold with me. <laughs> Anybody else have a cold right now? Oh, God bless you. All right, Colossians chapter 1, verse 3. Paul writes, We give thanks to God, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and your love for all the saints, Because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, which has come to you as it has also in all the world, and it is bringing forth fruit, as it also is among you since the day that you heard it, and knew the grace of God in truth, as you also learned from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf who also declared to us your love in the Spirit. For this reason, we also, since the day that we heard it, we do not cease to pray for you, to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might according to His glorious power, for all patience and long-suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness, conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, in whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. Father, this powerful passage before us, I ask that you would give us insight. <clears throat> that you'd use your word to transform us by the renewing of our minds, that we would be able to show forth in our lives this week what is your good and perfect will. Lord, your word is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, and I pray that you would cause it to go deep into my heart and the hearts of my brothers and sisters here, that your word would reveal the thoughts and the intents of our hearts, but also it would transform us, Lord, that we would show forth your glory in a world that is in such desperate need of light and truth. So God, use your word today. We ask this in Jesus' name, and all those that agreed said, 
Amen. You can be seated. We give thanks to God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. The Apostle Paul, if you've ever read through the New Testament, you know, was a prolific writer. He wrote 13 of the 27 books that are found in the New Testament. And in eight of those, nearly two-thirds of Paul's books, they all begin with these very similar words. I give thanks to God. Romans chapter 1, there in verse 8. First, he says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Then again in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 4, I thank my God always concerning you. Philippians chapter 1, verse 3, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Colossians chapter 1, verse 3, we just read, we give thanks to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says it again in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians and 1 Timothy and Philemon. All of those letters begin in the same way. I give thanks to God. I thank God whom I serve with a pure conscience as my forefathers did. Without ceasing, I remember you always in my prayers, he said there, to the church or to Timothy. And I think in this is a pattern of life. It's not just words that Paul would write, but the pattern that he lived. A pattern that is so important for you and I to be able to come into the fullness of life. Point number one on your outline There, your sermon guide is in your bulletin. A centered life maintains balance by thanksgiving to God. A centered life maintains balance by thanksgiving to God or giving thanks to God. How many of you, when you were a kid, at some point in your life played with a spinning top? Raise your hand. For some reason... Spinning tops are interesting to me. In saying this, don't go buy me a spinning top, please. <laughs> I, I, so interesting, and my, my wife, she knows I'm nuts, but I, I stumbled upon a Kickstarter campaign a few months ago, and they were making these little tops that were CNC milled out of metal, and I had to buy one, even though it was like $30 for a top. And I know that's crazy, but it's okay, because Terry spent far more money on his tops on the same one than I did. <laughs> but the thing about a top is that If it's done right, and if it's centered right and balanced right, you spin it with your fingers, and this top, it spins for what, Terry? Over a minute, right? Four minutes, he's got his... Four minutes, that's impressive. Four minutes. And it just, it doesn't even look like it's moving. It just looks like it's standing still. And and, oh, to have a life that has that kind of balance. People are looking for a life like that. I I think there's there's a sense here in our own nation, that we are a people that are out of balance. And people are always trying to find balance and equilibrium. They're trying to prioritize their life. How many of you guys feel like your priorities are just out of whack sometimes? I, I do constantly. And you just, you kind of feel like you're wobbling. You're not centered. One of the things I think we find as we go through the scriptures is that God wants to bring us into a place where our life is centered and balanced. That's why I've titled this series, Christocentric. The only way that you can maintain balance and have a a truly centered life is to have a life that is centered upon Christ. But that centered life maintains its balance through giving thanks to God. The proper orientation, the proper attitude in that giving of thanks. And, And notice here the attitude of gratitude, the attitude of thanksgiving of Paul is good, it's important. We, we need to be those that are giving thanks, but the focus is more important. It's giving thanks to God. In every one of those passages, those eight passages that I read, always Paul's thanksgiving was to God. You know, I was, I was talking with someone not too long ago, and they were talk, we were talking about gratitude, and they made the comment that, you know, they're just thankful to the universe. And you got to kind of just scratch your head when someone says something like that. And I get it. You know, it's 21st century America, postmodern world. People say all kinds of funny things, but I'm just thankful to the universe. And I just think to myself, the universe is, but it doesn't do really anything. It just is. It didn't do anything for you. It just is. But God created the universe. And so if you're going to be thankful, if you're going to have the right, proper attitude, 
of giving of thanks, the focus needs to be correct. And so for our lives to maintain that centered balance, it's got to be a thanksgiving that is to God. And here Paul patterns that for us. I thank God, making mention of you always in my prayers. Why was Paul thankful? Why, why did he pray for this group of believers that lived in a city a thousand miles away from him whom he'd never met? He'd never met these people before. And yet he says, I pray always for you. Any of you ever have this experience? Someone says to you, hey, would you pray for me this week? I've got something going on. I've got this thing that I've got to do at work. I've got to give this presentation. I've got this interview coming up. And they say, would you just pray for me this week? You say, yes, I'll pray for you. And then next week they come back and they go, thank you so much for praying for me. And you kind of feel that like, oh, goodness. Gosh, none of you? Man, look, nobody. <laughs> I feel like I have that every single week. I'll pray for you, and, and, and people we know, we know them, we love them, we say we'll pray for them, and we forget. You ever forgotten to pray for someone? Come on, be honest, I do all the time. Paul says, I, pr I pray for you continually. He didn't even know these people. Never had any personal interaction with them. He says, I give thanks to God for you. Why? Why was he praying continually for them? Well, he gives us insight as he continues there in verse 4. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus your love for all the saints because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. We thank God continually for you because of your faith, your love, your hope. These things have been called by Christian teachers for many, many years the essential Christian virtues. Faith, hope, and love. The essential Christian virtues. These are to be evident in my life. If I'm a follower of Jesus, these should begin to be expressed. Faith, hope, and love. Paul speaks of them in one of the most famous passages of Scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, now abide these three, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is, does anybody know? Love. Faith, hope, and love. And so Paul's thanksgiving and his prayer for the Christians there in the city of Colossae was based upon the fact that they and their lives were showing forth these Christian virtues. Someone had come and shared with Paul about the work, the church that was growing there in the city of Colossae. In fact, we'll be introduced to the person in just a moment who shared with Paul about what was going on there. But this individual came to Paul and he said, listen, there's a church that's been planted. I know you've never been there, but it's a fruit of your ministry because this individual is a fruit of Paul's ministry and he says it's a fruit of your ministry. And there in the city of Colossae, a thousand miles away, this little city there in the middle of central uh, Asia Minor, there's a group of people who are following Jesus and their lives are beginning to manifest faith, hope, and love. And Paul was filled with joy. His heart was lifted up and he begins to pray for them because they had faith, hope, and love. These three are absolutely essential for us to experience a fulfilling life. The abundant life that Jesus spoke of when he said in John chapter 10, it's recorded in verse 10, I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly or to its fullest. These three components, ingredients, are essential to a life that is abundant and fulfilling. Faith, hope, and love. But the sad reality is that Oftentimes our faith is lacking, our love is misplaced, and many people would be characterized more by hopelessness than hope. People want hope. They long for it. That, that's why it was so hugely championed in the 2008 presidential election, hope. And people just gravitate towards that desire for hope. But many people, their faith is lacking, their love is misplaced, and their hope is more hopeless than hopeful. And even in saying that, I'm describing maybe some that are here in this room today. Hopefully not many, but it may be the reality that you're in a place where your faith is lacking, your love is misplaced, and your hope is more hopeless than hopeful. And, and I would say that Core to this, us moving in the direction of becoming those that lack faith and have misplaced love, is having the wrong focus to our faith. Oftentimes, our faith, our confidence, especially in 21st century America, is in ourselves. 
We're taught from a very young age in this culture. It's a, it's a cultural waypoint, if you will, to come to a place where you trust in yourself. Number one, I got to believe in me. You ever heard anybody say something like that? Ever said something like that? I got to believe in me. I can trust only in myself. I'm the only one I really trust. We hear people say these kind of things in our culture today constantly. But the fact is, every single one of us falls short of our own expectations. We fall short and we realize that the ability wasn't quite there. The steadfastness of character that we thought we had wasn't there. The, the older we get, the more fragile we realize we are. The more we realize that we let ourselves down and we let other people down. So if your faith is misplaced, if the focus of your faith is yourself, then there's a reason why you might feel hopeless over time. But even if your faith, your confidence, your trust is not in yourself, if your faith is in your spouse, you don't have to be married for 24 hours to realize that that's misplaced faith. <laughs> My poor wife, she trusted me, and man. I, <laughs> if your faith, your confidence is in your spouse, they will let you down. If you're a newlywed today, and I'm telling you this, and this first time you heard it, I'm sorry, but they'll let you down. We normally tell people in the marriage counseling, premarital counseling, they're going to let you down. It's so cute sometimes. They'll look at it, no, never. No, really. <laughs> Dumb love, right? That's what we call it. But wrongly focused faith will leave you in a place of broken faith. If your faith is in your career path, if your faith is in your 401k, if your faith is in your health, if your faith is in whatever it may be, it will let you down if it's not Christ. Amen. Notice what Paul commended these Christians for and what he praised God for. They had faith in Christ. Their faith had the right focus. And so he says there, we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus. Point number two on your outline. A balanced life begins with focused faith. You will not have a centered or balanced life if your faith is not focused on Christ. A balanced life begins with focused faith. And, and having a wrongly focused faith, it affects things. Paul praised them, commended the Christians at Colossae because not only they had a faith in Christ, but they had love. But it was a certain focus of love, a love for all the saints. You see, if your faith is in yourself, then you'll have a misplaced love, an inordinate self-love. Now, self-love is not abnormal. All of us love ourselves. In fact, if you hated yourself, you wouldn't take care of yourself. So there's a certain measure of self-love that is actually important for us to thrive in life. But there is an inordinate or an excessive self-love. And oftentimes when people put all their trust and confidence in themselves, they manifest a self-love that is excessive and can ultimately be harmful. That self-love grows to such a place that they become so overly protective of themselves that they never step out into any new thing because they're afraid of how they might be perceived by others. They're afraid that they might injure their, their character, their reputation or who they are by, by doing or saying this, by stepping out and sharing the gospel. So what will people think of me? That's a clue into that there's an excessive self-love. And so having the wrong focus of your faith will lead to a misplaced love, which will leave you helpless or hopeless. And Paul here says to the Colossians, you have faith in Christ Jesus and you have love for all the saints. When your faith is focused on Christ, it will bring into alignment these other things. It'll bring them into center, if you will, into balance. So much so, point number three, a Christ-focused faith will shift the focus of your love. When your faith is in Christ, centered upon Him, it will shift the focus of your love from self-focused to saint-focused. And that's a good move. That's a good transition that takes place. This will lead us into the experience of fulfillment, of joy. I know that it's an odd thing to say 
it's sad that it is, but this is kind of the outgrowth of the middle part of the 20th century of Christianity and America in the 20th century has moved us to a place to where we feel weird hearing this or saying it, but God wants us to experience happiness. And there's some of you right now that are going, well, no, there's a difference between joy and happiness. I get it. It's an amazing thing that's taken place, and it's really the outgrowth of 20th century Christianity in America where we have this guttural reaction where it's wrong to be happy. It's not. God desires that we would experience happiness. But here's the point. Happiness is only found in Him. It's only found in Him. Happiness apart from Him leads to idolatry, which is ultimately going to lead you to unhappiness. It might be temporarily happy, but it will lead you to unhappiness. And so God wants us to experience this joy and happiness and fulfillment, but it cannot happen without focus upon Christ as the centerpiece of your trust and your confidence. And he brings into alignment our love. We move from self-focused love to saint-focused love. And it's moving us in the direction of joy, not only from Not only does having a Christ-centered focus of our faith affect our love, but it it changes our hope. He says here that you have faith in Christ Jesus and love for all the saints, verse 5, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. Point number four on your outline. You and I, we cannot have hope for heaven without Christ-focused faith. You cannot have hope of heaven without Christ-focused faith. The Colossians had put their faith in Christ Jesus. It had changed the way that they loved people. That It was evident. And it had made them a hopeful people. There's all kinds of things in this world that can affect our hopefulness. We're bombarded by things every single week that will affect our hopefulness. And if your faith and your confidence and your trust are not centered upon Christ, you will lose your hope, which will lead to a loss of peace. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, the Proverbs say. And there's all kinds of people in our nation that are heart sick. We may be one of the most heart sick nations in the world, which doesn't make any sense because we have so much abundance. And you look around and you say, how is that possible? Because... The focus of our confidence and trust is on the wrong things. Which has affected the way that we love. Which has led to a loss of hope. Jesus, as he was getting ready to go into the most pressing circumstance that anyone could ever imagine. And his disciples were there with him and they're watching this unfold and it's affecting them as well. And their hearts are troubled. He says to them, it's recorded in John chapter 14, let not your heart be troubled. Well, this is a really terrible situation we're going through right now, Jesus. What do you mean, let not your heart be troubled? Yeah, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Were it not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. That's hope. But if your confidence and your trust today is upon yourself and your good works to get you there, to be with the Lord in heaven, then you have very little hope. In fact, I've talked with people for years, and I ask them, if you died tonight, would you go to heaven? And they say, well, I hope so. But their, their statement sounds more like, well, I really hope I win the lottery. It's kind of like a wishful thinking. It's not a, a steadfast, absolute assurance. You say, well, what are you basing that hope on? Well, I'm a, I'm a pretty good person. That, that's where your hope is? No wonder you're hopeless. My hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust in anything. If I'm trusting and putting my confidence, my faith in any other thing, I, there's no wonder I would be hopeless. But the Christian, their confidence, their trust, is in the finished work of Jesus, what he accomplished on the cross 2,000 years ago, when he took your sin, my sin, upon himself, and all the punishment for our sin came upon him, and there on the cross he said, it is finished, it's paid in full. My confidence is in him, that what he did is sufficient. Therefore, I have absolute assurance that when he said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. It has nothing to do with my good works. He has done it. 
For by grace are you saved, through faith, that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. There's no boasting. It's all about His grace. And so, these believers in Colossae, they had faith in Christ. Their confidence was in Him. And it had altered the way that they loved one another, which has in turn given them, personally, a hope for heaven. Which makes up the interesting equation, and some of you, especially if you've ever served in children's ministry, have seen that little acronym that we teach third graders about joy. Joy is Jesus, others, you, right? What do we have here? Faith in Jesus, love for others, and you receive hope for heaven. That's a joyful place to be. This is what God wants to bring us into with this Christocentric focus. But you cannot have this hope for heaven without Christ as the center focus of your faith. And having Christ as the focus or the focal point of your faith, your confidence being in Him, it will shift the focus of your love from self-focused to saint-focused. And this is all bringing us into a life that is in focus, a life that is balanced, a life that has center. And all of it is upon him, Jesus. We all orbit, if you will, him. He's the gravitational pull that keeps my life where it needs to be. How come the earth doesn't just go off somewhere off into the wilderness or into the universe somewhere and just kind of careen through the universe like a shooting star or like, you know, an asteroid or some sort of thing like that? Because it's got something strong as its center that keeps it in gravitational alignment. And that needs to be Christ for my life and for your life. And Paul rejoiced in the church at Colossae. He gave thanks to God because that's where they were. They had God at the center. The Colossians had put their faith in Christ. They had love for one another. They had hope for heaven. Where did all this come from? Verse 5, the middle of verse 5, he says, Of which you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel, the good news, the gospel which has come to you, as it has also in all the world, and it is bringing forth fruit. Where the gospel goes, it produces fruit. As it is also among you since the day that you heard and you knew the grace of God and truth. That it wasn't about your good works. It wasn't about your confidence and your trust in yourself or in some other thing in this world, but on Christ alone. And you learned this from Epaphras. The person who shared the gospel with those people there in the city of Colossae was a guy by the name of Epaphras, our dear fellow servant who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. It's very likely that Epaphras was the one who heard Paul teach, became a disciple of Jesus under Paul's ministry while Paul was teaching in a city called Ephesus. It's recorded in Acts chapter 19 in the New Testament. It's very likely that Epaphras became a follower of Jesus and a disciple of Christ through the ministry of Paul, and then he went back to the city of Colossae and he shared the gospel with them, and a church was started. And after that, church began to grow and manifest faith in Christ and love for all the saints and hope for heaven. Epaphras went to Rome and he shared with Paul, hey, Paul, I want to tell you about what's happening in Colossae. There's a group of people there I went and shared the gospel with, and now they're manifesting faith, hope, and love. And Paul was overjoyed. Having never met them before, he hears their testimony through Epaphras. Verse 8, he declared to us your love in the Spirit. What was the identifying characteristic that they were followers of Jesus? Their love in the Spirit. And to which Paul responds with prayer. He goes, I heard about you through Epaphras. He told us what was going on there in the city of Colossae. And you know what I did immediately after that? I prayed for you. And here's his prayer. It's beautiful. Verse 9. For this reason, we also, whoever Paul was with, Timothy and Luke, we all, since the day that we heard from Epaphras about your faith in Christ and about love and hope manifesting in your midst, we do not cease to pray for you and to ask for things, that you would be filled with the knowledge of his will and all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, that you'd be strengthened with all might according to his glorious power for all patience, long suffering with joy, and that you'd give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. Now, just as a side note, 
Paul is the master of the run-on sentence. <laughs> I love Paul. If you are an English major and you correct students' grammar all the time, that you, this like drives you crazy and you want to break out your red pen. I know, Sierra, you're thinking about it and you want to, like, that was wrong syntax and that was not the right place for that. Paul is the master of the run-on sentence, which probably all of us, if we had a transcriber writing down our prayers when we pray, we'd probably all just run on sentences. And we could spend weeks going through what Paul prays for these believers there in Colossae. These four prayers or four things that he prays for them. First, he prays that they would be filled with the knowledge of God's will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. You know, this is my prayer for you as well. That you would know God's will. You know, probably the number one question I receive from people is people email me, they call me, they come by the church here during the week, and I got this decision, I don't know what to do. What do you think God wants me to do? And I look at them and I go, I don't know. And they give me this blank stare like, what do you do around here all week? (laughs) I'm not your guru. Sorry. I want to make a shirt that says, Jesus is my guru. But I do pray that you would have the knowledge of God's will. That you would know what God wants you to do. I think it's an admirable and good thing that you want to know what God wants you to do. But I want you to know what God wants you to do. Sure, I got all kinds of things that I'd like for you to do. (laughs) What does God want you to do? Now here's the thing. He says, "I, I pray for you that you'd have knowledge of God's will in all wisdom. You see, knowledge and wisdom are different. Knowledge is knowing things, knowing information, knowing truths. Wisdom is knowing what to do with what you know. It's putting it into practice. My good friend Randy Broberg, and I've said it before, I stole it from him, it's great. Knowledge is knowing that a tomato is a fruit. Wisdom is knowing not to put it in the fruit salad. It's simple, but it's helpful. There's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. And the scary thing is, is that you can come to church week in and week out, or you can even read your Bible five, six, seven days a week. You can read through the scriptures and know a lot of truths about God and about the Bible and know a lot of things about what God would want you to do and never do it. And so Paul says, I pray that you would have the knowledge of God's will with all wisdom and spiritual understanding. And it leads right into the next part of his prayer. And he says that you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing him being fruitful in every good work. Paul says, I pray to God that you would know what God wants you to do, you'd know how to apply that, and then that you'd do it. That you'd do it. You'd walk it out. It's a sad reality, but it's a reality nonetheless. I have had so many conversations with people over the years who know the Bible really well. They, they could argue all day long about reform theology. They could argue all day long about the end times and eschatology. They could argue all day long about the person and work of the Holy Spirit and pneumatology, and their life is in shambles. They could argue with me about superlapsarianism, and to most of you go, what in the world is that? Don't look it up. It'll totally freak you out. It's a biblical theological term. Superlapsarianism. They can come argue with me about superlapsarianism, and, and yet they're living in an adulterous relationship wow, this really is not helping you at all. And you know what? They're the worst kind of witness for Jesus. Because all the non-Christians that they know, they go, yeah, it's so great that you know that and you go to church, but your life is crap. And so Paul says, I pray for you, that you'd know God's will and you know how to put it into practice and then that you'd do it, that you'd live it out, that you'd be fully pleasing to him. Bearing fruit was Paul's prayer. He goes on. I pray that you'd be strengthened with all might by his power. Now, how do you say that sounds good? I want some of that might and power from God. God, would you pour out your strength and power and might upon the church in Colossae or the church in North County? Would you pour out your power and might upon them? And in our minds, we're seeing like casting demons out of people and healing the sick and walking on water. and That's the kind of thing that we're seeing. But notice the application of power that he's praying for here. God, would you give them strength with all might by his power for all 
patience. That was not where I was thinking that was going. And long suffering with joy. God, I pray for the church at Colossae that they would know your will, that they would put it into practice, and that they would be patient with joy in the midst of trying circumstances. Now that's a witness for Jesus. You could know all the ins and outs of the five points. If you don't have that, what good is it? Finally, he prays that they'd give thanks to the Father for qualifying them to receive the inheritance of the saints. God, I pray for the church at Colossae that they'd be a thankful people. They'd recognize that their position today is not because of anything that they had done, but their position today is because you qualified them to be partakers of the inheritance for no other reason than that you, by your grace, made them saints. Point number five on your outline. Christ-focused faith compels prayer. And I kind of wrote on the edge of this for others. I thought of it later on. (laughs) Christ-focused faith compels prayer for others. Paul prayed for the Colossian Christians that they would know God's will, that they would live God's will, and that in the living of God's will, they would show forth patience and long-suffering with joy in the midst of trying circumstances, and they would give thanks to God in whatever situation they were in. And then Paul wraps it up by saying this. He, God, has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. You want something to be thankful for today? He has saved you and taken you out of darkness and put you in light and made you a son of the kingdom of His love in whom, Jesus, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins. You say, I don't have anything to be thankful for today. That's something to be thankful for. You got 25 days to get ready for Thanksgiving to thank God for that. If for nothing else, that's worthy of Thanksgiving. Amen? Amen. Let's stand together as we close in prayer. Father God, I pray for my brothers and sisters here today that you would Fill us with all knowledge and wisdom of your will. God, that you would enable us. Because, Lord, we're not sufficient of ourselves and we we have no power or strength that you would enable us by your power to walk worthy. To walk in a way that shows that you are glorious and true and awesome in our lives. Lord, help us, make us pleasing to you in not only our actions and our words, but in our thought life, Lord. Help us to be pleasing to you and to bear fruit as we increase in the knowledge of you. Lord, would you strengthen us this week as we all will go through trials. Every single one of us will face difficulties this week that we are tempted to be impatient and unkind through, would you give us the ability by your Holy Spirit to be those who have patience and long-suffering with joy? These are all fruits of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Lord, work these things into our lives. We can't make this happen on our own. Lord, would you help us to be a thankful people? You spoke words of judgment upon the nation of Israel in the Old Testament because they were unthankful. You said in the last days there will come a group of people who are unthankful. May it not be said of us that we are unthankful. Lord, help us to acknowledge that every good and perfect gift comes from you. And Lord, to live lives that glorify you through our gratitude. Lord, bring our lives into focus. 
bring our lives into focus so that we'd have a balanced and focused faith, a love for others, and an absolute certainty that we will be with you forever. We pray this in Jesus' name, and all those that agree to say, Thank you.